So this week, we're finishing the Sermon on the Mount for about 15 weeks. We've been studying this as the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher to ever walk the planet, King Jesus. People started seeing what he was doing. The crowd started to gather. He went up on a mountain and started teaching. And for the last 2,000 years, this sermon has been challenging the church. Challenging on what we believe, how we live, and how our belief impacts our life. And how it should pervade into every detail of our life. And really, today is this climactic, this, this final incredible illustration that he gives. Just this climactic point in the entire Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, on uh, how, what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. He gives us this, this final uh, illustration, and he's called everyone that heard him and everyone who has read these words for the last 2,000 years to a point of introspection and to a point of decision. To a point to, to look inside our soul and then to decide which path to take. See, it's interesting to me in preaching classes, they teach you to, to craft these interesting and catchy introductions that will grab people's attention. They say you need to hook your audience. I think that's nonsense. I think the Word of God should hook our audience. Here's how Jesus, the greatest preacher to ever live, hooked his audience. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He hooked them with the words of Scripture. And from that point, from those very first words, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, he has started to turn everyone's expectations upside down something radically different than what they had expected. Not a slick and catchy introduction, but I guarantee you Jesus caught their attention right out of the gate because Jesus was teaching them that citizenship in his kingdom carries an attitude of brokenness. Where the religious teachers of his day carried an attitude of pridefulness. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. He said, blessed are those who mourn over their own sinfulness for they will be comforted. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the humble, the meek. Certainly not the attitude of the religious leaders of his day. And from these opening statements, the, the Beatitudes is what we call them. Jesus turns all of their expectations upside down. He, he turns their view of the scriptures of God, their view of God, their view of their neighbors, their view of righteousness that God honors, completely on its head. And by chapter 7, Jesus has transitioned to a theme of judgment. Really, from all of, cha all of chapter 7 has this underlying current of judgment. And hear me, I, I want you to hear me so clearly this morning that judgment is real. Judgment is real. God will judge all people. That's not a very engaging message, but I promise you it's true. God will judge all people. And really this climactic point in the Sermon on the Mount, this final illustration that Jesus gives points us to the reality that God will judge all people people. Judgment is real. It's going to happen. And remember in Matthew chapter 5 verse 20 he said unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and scribes you'll never get into the kingdom. And he's not saying like those dudes have a 98 so you need to have a 99 on the righteousness scale. He's not saying like those dudes set the curve you need to beat the curve. He's saying those dudes have this external form of righteousness that is awful and you need something more. You need an internal righteousness that only the Spirit of Christ can give you. Because he gives us that statement where unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. He gives us that statement to point our desperate need, to point us to our desperate need for Jesus. Because those dudes checked every single box. They gave their money, they read the scriptures, they taught people. You know, they perverted a bunch of laws, but they checked like every single box that you could check, they would check. And even the boxes that weren't created yet, they would create them and then they would check them. They would say, okay, I filled this list of 68 things. I'm going to add 42 more things. We're going to have a list of 110 things and I'm going to check every single box. 
That's the type of righteousness. Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and scribes, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. And he wants us to know because judgment is real. Apart from the righteousness of Christ, judgment is horrific. He wants us to know that you need Jesus. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. As our team led us in music earlier. We need Jesus' righteousness because judgment is real. Our sinfulness is real. It's not like I just made a little mistake, but at least I didn't rob a bank. No, like your sinfulness is real. Preacher I listened to out in Texas, he plays this little game called the Ten Commandment Pop Quiz. He said, you ever lied to somebody? Well, yeah. Okay, so you're a liar. Guilty. He said, you ever gotten mad at anybody? Well, yeah. Okay, you're a murderer. Guilty. How many more we got to go through? Right? See, every one of us is broken. It doesn't, we don't have to work down too far through the list to see our need for that exceeding righteousness that only Jesus gives. He calls us. He points us to the truth of judgment and calls us to himself. He says, apart from my righteousness, everything you have is rubbish, it's filth. But trust in me. Build your life on my words. Build your life, build your life in faith in my name, my character, my person. Take my righteousness through faith. Let me give you my righteousness through faith. We'll see that you have lots to stand on at that point. And it's in this tone that Jesus gives us this final climactic illustration in the Sermon on the Mount. So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. I preach and teach from the Christian Standard Bible, CSB. We actually have hard copies of that on our welcome table. If anyone would like to get one, you're welcome to take one of those hard copies. They're tan leather. They're nice. Um, it'll also be up on the screen. So for anyone, just make sure you're, you're seeing it in the CSB. If you use your device, go to the top and pull up the CSB so we can be together. Final climactic words in this greatest sermon ever preached by King Jesus himself. It says, therefore... Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears the words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the the sand, the rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them like one who had authority and not like their scribes. Let's pray together. We'll understand this text together. Heavenly Father, God, open our hearts to hear and act on your word this morning. Father, I pray that your word and your spirit would work in our lives right now. And that we would leave here changed, God. Changed by the power of your word and the work of your spirit working together in our lives, God. In Jesus' name. So remember two weeks ago, two weeks ago we were in the earlier section where we had this, these comparisons, the theme of a narrow gate and a broad road. You remember my family and I watched Facing the Giants at the movie. And you remember he's coaching up the field goal kicker and he says, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Now as a Miami Hurricanes fan, we missed a field goal last night. We had a field goal blocked and we had a field, uh, an extra point blocked, right? Yeah, so we missed three kicks and all I could think of, like, broad is the gate that leads to destruction because that was horrible. That wasn't all I could think of, but you know what I'm saying. But narrow, 
the, the, the broad road that leads to destruction, like when your kicker pulls it and he hooks it 28 yards left, then he could have tied the game with three seconds left in the game. But narrow is the gate, the uprights, where the opposing team, their kicker, happened to make every one of his kicks. Broad gate, br narrow gate, broad road. Remember, we, we had this comparison of a false teacher and a true teacher. He said, the false teacher comes to you dressed in sheep's clothing like a ravenous wolf. Like, all they're going to do is damage. A false teacher and a true teacher. He gave this comparison about a good tree and a bad tree. You know, they both look like they're growing and thriving, but their fruit is awful. Bite into the wrong type of fruit, and you realize, oh, that's a bad tree. And then all of that was building to this point of true belief and false belief. What I would even suggest to you, what James suggests to us in his book of the Bible, that is a demonic belief. There's a, a true belief in Christ and a demonic belief where he says even the demons believe and they tremble. And building on this theme of comparison, Jesus is, is unpacking what it means to be a citizen in the kingdom of heaven. He's giving us these comparisons. He gives us more comparisons in this climactic illustration in the entire sermon. He gives us an illustration about two houses, two builders, and two foundations. And the picture are two different people, but I want us to hear this morning is that these are people in the church because they're hearing Jesus' sermon. Like this, is, this isn't a picture of people that, that aren't, that are outside of the church, that, that aren't professing faith in Christ. This is a picture of people in the church because he says, anyone who hears my words, to hear the words of Christ, assumes that you're in the church, you're in the company of Christians, at least at some level. He's drawing comparisons about two people sitting in the pew on Sunday. He says, look, we've got two houses, two builders, and two foundations. And as com more comfortable it would be for all of us to think, well, this is talking about church people and unchurched people. No, he's talking about people in the pew on Sunday or Saturday night or whatever night you choose to worship on, but got no foundation. It's a picture of a Christian, one that has been born again by the power of the Spirit of Christ. And a picture of that of a person that's just been involved in a little religious hobby. The first comparison he gives is the wise man and the fool. The wise man and the fool. And the wise man, we, we, we see this, is the one that hears Jesus' words and acts. Hear and act. If you have a paper Bible, I want to encourage you to underline that word hear. I want to encourage you to underline or circle that word and act. Hear and act. Anyone with children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews or younger brothers and sisters or whatever, you know there's a difference between hearing there's a totally different thing about hearing and acting. Right? He says, anyone who hears and acts on these words of mine on them, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. See, picture here is that you dig and you dig and you dig. This, this illustration Jesus gives about the building on the rock is Digging down, going down deep, doing the hard work to dig down deep to get to that level of bedrock, that, that foundational rock that can support a vertical structure. A couple of things that I think we can, we can imply from this short illustration about the wise. See, no one wakes up one morning and just knows how to build a house. I know that surprised my wife. I'm not the handiest of guys. I can do some, do some plumbing, but anything more than plumbing, I get a little scared, especially if there's electrical current flowing through those wires. I don't want her to be widowed this young. Uh, you don't wake up one day and know how to build a house. You have to be taught how to build a house. You don't wake up one day and know you got to dig down deep. you got to keep digging until you hit the foundational rock level. You don't just wake up one day and know it. One way or another, the wise man had to have learned from others. He had, maybe he watched them build a house. Maybe his dad and his grandpa taught him how to build a house when he was a kid. Maybe he worked as a builder. I have no idea. What I do know is that he didn't wake up one day and know how to build a house. Somebody had to tell him he had to learn how to build the house. He was a worker. We imply from this that he was a worker. He wouldn't have been concerned with just getting something vertical for his wife and kids to live in. He wanted to make sure he got it right. He wanted the house, but he wanted it done 
right. He couldn't have been looking for just a quick fix. Now the comparison, the foolish man, the one that hears Jesus' words and doesn't do what he says, we compare the two where the wise man at least sought out some help. The implications of fool didn't. Because no one would ever, ever, ever say, oh, you don't need to dig down. Just start going vertical. Just start laying brick. Like, no one's ever going to tell somebody to build like that. I mean, that's just foolish. It's not just foolish. It's stupid. No competent builder would have ever let this dude build his house that way. So the implication is that he didn't ask anyone. He was trying to be a lone ranger. He was foolish. He was either lazy or impatient or, or maybe he was both. <coughs> what we know is that it would be absolutely <coughs> absurd to build a house without a proper foundation. I know a little bit about construction. I know that before you go vertical, you have to do soil tests to see what kind of structure your soil can support all kinds of tests to understand how deep a foundation you need to, to, to dig, how deep you need to go with your footers. I mean, I know a little bit about that. No one would have ever told this guy. Think about just a simple, just a simple one room kind of a building. No one would have ever told this dude, just start throwing up some mud bricks and go for it. I think that would be absurd. Both of these guys built their houses on something. One was a good foundation, the other not so much. And Jesus' warning here is that if we hear his words, we must respond. Every one of us must respond to his words. We can respond like the wise man. We can hear and do, or we can hear and say, ah, that's nice, and not do. Everyone must respond. And to be clear, though, I, I want to make it clear that we are absolutely saved by grace through faith. All of the Bible affirms that. But when Jesus takes over our life by grace through faith, we will always be different. From the moment you are given new life, you will be different. You will hear and respond to his words differently. That's the power of the Holy Spirit that comes upon you at conversion. The moment you believe the gospel, you will be new and different. In a life that is made new by the power of the gospel, remember, it's not perfect. If you've been in our church more than two weeks, you know that it's not about perfection. It's about progress. Do we see that we're not the same person we were two months ago? Two years ago? Twelve years ago? Do we see the fruit of the Spirit growing in our lives? See, we think about progress, not instant perfection. In the moment... By the power of the gospel, the moment that you are given that new life, we start seeing the words of this book and wanting to obey it. That's evidence of the Holy Spirit at work in your life. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 says, It is God who works in you. It is God who works in you both to will and to act according to his good pleasure. See, God working in you changes your desires, your will, what you want to to do. God working in you changes what you do do. It is God working in you both to will and to work according to his good purposes. And when we respond to Jesus in faith, like real life-changing faith, like, like Jesus, you are Lord. Everything is here. You tell me what to do and I will do it. The Holy Spirit begins to change our desires and our affections. And we begin we begin. To want to live in a way that brings glory to God. And how do we do that? We obey His Word. We obey His Word. We obey His Word. Not because we're trying to tip the scales or trying to earn anything or trying to you know, hope we get to 51 good and 49 bad but because of what Jesus has accomplished for you on your behalf. 
And this is the heart behind James' instruction, which really parallels much of the Sermon on the Mount. See, the, the book of James, written by Jesus' half-brother, really is an exposition. It's a, it's a deeper analogy of much of the teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And in James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, he says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. That's the words of James, inspired by the Holy Spirit. See, in Jesus' final words here, he's giving us this comparison. He says, there are people that will hear my word and will act on it. And there are people that will hear my word and ignore it. Which are you going to be? Which are you going to be? In this great climactic illustration, as he talks about the two builders, they each built a house. We don't really see the two houses. We don't really see anything different between the two houses. We don't know if one like had granite, the other one had marble countertops. I don't know. Maybe one had a black fridge and the other one had a stainless fridge. I don't know. We don't know anything about the difference here. But I believe the implication of this illustration is that <clears throat> the two houses look basically the same. You wouldn't just walk up and say, oh, well, that one. I'm not going to go in that one. Right? The two houses look basically the same. Because remember, Jesus is talking to church people here. This is a message to church people. Two houses look basically the same. Probably provided some good shade when it was hot. Probably both basically functional under normal circumstances. You wouldn't tell any difference. But we know that normal circumstances don't happen all the time, especially not here in Southwest Florida as we all were panicking last week, really, I guess maybe eight days ago, nine days ago, our public sold out of water, bottled water, Friday, a week, week, two days ago. See, we know that normal circumstances in hurricane season in Southwest Florida, we know that normal circumstances don't always just last. So we're having problems with the Wi-Fi, folks, I'm sorry. This is how it goes. Matt, just don't worry about it, you can leave it off, man. We know normal circumstances don't happen all the time. We know the hurricanes happen, windstorms happen, rainstorms happen, storm surge happens. And what it says in these verses is that both, both houses were pounded, pounded by the storms. They were pounded by the storms. Maybe some English translations say were beaten by the storms. I like the word pound. When I was in middle school, we used to talk about, I'm going to pound you. Now I'm teaching my boys one and says, I'm going to drop you. <coughs> Sean Coast, these houses were both dropped by the storm. And I'm going to drop you later when we wrestle. So we've got these, these two builders, these two houses, and we've got the same kind of event. It says in verse 25 and again in verse 27, the rain came, the winds blew, both houses were pounded. A couple of ways I think we should think through this word storm. Here, Jesus is talking about using an illustration. He's talking about a metaphorical storm. And I think in, in one very real way, you can view a storm as a season of life. No one ever sets out to get fired from a job. No one's marriage ever sets out to end in divorce. No one ever has kids hoping that they would be rebellious one day. Like we all, when we sit down in, in whatever circumstance we're in, when we project on our life, we just assume it's all going to go up and to the right, right? I mean, it's, at some level, we all assume it's, everything's going to go up and to the right, but we know that that doesn't happen. For a decade, I would look at prospective businesses. They would come in and they would give me their projection of what they were going to do. And you know what? Just leave it there. Um, you know what would, would always happen? Every single business projection went up and to the right. You know what actually happened? None of them went up and to 
the right, like up to the right. Things don't ever go the way we project, both in business and in life. And I think at a very basic level, the storm is what we can think through. You know what? Maybe we don't make the grade in school. Maybe we don't get the part. Maybe we don't get the promotion. Maybe we do have a teenager that rebels. Maybe our marriage doesn't end the way we had set out for it to be. Whatever. Maybe we get sick and you know what? The call is, there's nothing we can do about it. Things happen. Things happen. It says pounded. Both houses got pounded by the storm. Things happen. I think in one sense we can view it as the season of life. When things don't go up and to the right. But I think there's another type of storm here. I think there's a spiritual storm. Spiritual storms are real. Spiritual storms are real. Paul would write about them to the church in Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 6, he says this. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. So that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. He says, put on the full armor. Like, you're going to battle? You best be prepared. Because things happen. He says, so you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Here's what he, what he concludes that, that section with. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness. Against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. Listen to me loud and clear. The devil is real. And he's a schemer, and he's vicious, and he wants to tear you down. His primary objective for you is to distract you and get you on the sidelines. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, he's already lost. He's already lost the battle for your soul. Now he wants to distract you and put you off to the side. In a very real way, we do have spiritual storms. And the devil's scheme is to tear you down. He's going to come at you when you're where you're weak. He's not going to say, oh, well, Paul's really strong here. Let me see if I can get him there. He's going to say, oh, the coffin around that window isn't real good. We just blow some extra rain right at that window where the coffin's not real good. And that water's going to get behind the coffin. And then what's going to happen, that water's going to get into the studs. And he's going to start getting some mold. And before he realizes it, the whole wall is going to be worthless. And I'm going to get him. So the devil knows where you're weak. He knows your weakness is better than you do. And he's going to scheme at you to come get you in your weak spots. That's where he's going to come at you. So we have the, the season in life and the schemes of the devil, two types of storms. But I think there is even more here, not the, just the storms of life and the schemes of the devil. It's that final day of judgment because judgment is real. Every one of us will be judged by God. When you, when you will stand before God and the, the Lord of the whole world will either say, yep, I got your name in my book. He's mine. Come on in. Or depart from me. I never knew you. Folks, judgment is real. And that end of life judgment is real. Not a one of us is guaranteed another breath. That end of life judgment is real. The Lord of the world. It says in Colossians that by him, through him, and for him, all things were created. I'm saying, yep, he's mine. She's mine. Or depart from me. I never do you. How do you tell the difference? The message given to church, folks, how do you tell the difference? The wise builder, the good house, the foolish builder, the bad house. You have to look at the foundation. You have to look at the foundation. I was researching this in my preparation, and I was like, what's the most expensive <coughs> construction repairs? And I stumbled across, across this article by a company called We Buy Ugly Houses. You see those signs, maybe like car magnets and signs in the ground that we buy ugly houses. 
And he gives us this thing. He, he, these guys wrote this, this thing, this article that lists the 11 most expensive home repair stuff like mold repair, and deck repair, and driveway repair, all kinds of stuff made the list. And they gave a range, and I think their ranges were a little bit off. But like the second most expensive thing there was a foundation problem. On the high side of the range, you look down the, the right, the high side of the range. And according to webuyuglyhouses.com, a foundation problem is going to cost you big time. <coughs> big time. Because you built on the wrong stuff. Everything's built up on top of it already. What do you do? Foundation problem is going to cost you. And Jesus says that there's a way to build a house that will stand the test of the storm. But there's also a much easier way to build a house that will never, ever stand the testing of the storm. One is quick and easy and takes very little effort. But when the storm comes, it's going to be wiped out. The other is hard, just like the narrow gate from two weeks ago. When the storms come, because it was rightly built, it was built on the word of Christ, it will last. So I think the question, the question is, how do you know if your foundation is on the rock or on the sand? This is a message to church people, people that are hearing the word of Christ. How do you know if your foundation is on the rock or on the sand? See, according to Jesus, it depends on what you do with this book. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. What do you do with this? How do you receive the word of God? How do you receive it? Oh, well, I don't agree with that part. Oh. Oh, well, I'm not going to do that part. Oh, really? In 1 John, he makes the same argument. I love how the Bible works together. The Holy Spirit inspired these writers, these authors to put down the words that work together beautifully together. He says this in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. He says, this is how we know that we know him if we keep his commands. The one who says, I have come to know him and yet doesn't keep his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly in him, the love of God is made complete. This is how we know we are in him. We, this is how we know we are in him. This is how we know our foundation is on the rock. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. The main idea this morning is that Jesus is the only foundation that will ever last. Jesus is the only foundation that will ever last. We can build our houses on good things. But if Jesus is in the foundation of our lives, that house won't last. So when we come to Jesus, we come to him as Savior to save us from our sin. But there's another side to that. We submit to him as Lord. So you can't have one without the other. Those two work together. Like you can't say, well, I trust Jesus to save me, but I'm going to live my life the way I want to. How it works. It's not how the Word of God says it works. That those two work together. Savior and Lord work together because we hear and act. We trust that God is redirecting our desires and our affections, just like Paul wrote to the Philippian church in, in verse two, chapter two, verse thirteen, that it is God who works in you both to will and to work according to His good purposes. We trust that God is redirecting our affections, redirecting our desires, changing us to want, so that we want to obey Him as an overflow of the life that He's given us. So, what does it mean? To call Jesus Lord in your job. What does it mean in your job to call Jesus as Lord? What does it mean in your relationships with your spouse, with your kids, 
with your parents to call Jesus Lord. It means to honor your parents. It means to trust your parents. What does it mean at school to call Jesus as Lord? It means you do the right thing even when people aren't looking at you. See, this whole thing about Jesus as Lord can apply to a 7-year-old and it can apply to a 97-year-old. But every one of us needs to decide what that means and follow it. It means we trust him. We take Jesus at his word and we follow him. I want to encourage you to do that today. If that's not where you are spiritually, just let me know. Check on the box. Say, Paul, can we talk? I want to know what it means to have Jesus as Lord. I want to know what it means to surrender to Jesus as Lord. Check on that box on your card. You can drop it in the offering plate at the end of our service. You can hand it to me. We go out for coffee. That's my favorite meal of the day. But don't, please don't leave here. If you're saying, you know, Paul, I don't know Jesus as Lord. Please don't leave here today without taking a step toward knowing him as Lord. Whether it's checking a box on a card, whether asking a friend that you know and that you trust. Let's pray together. God, you are so good and so gracious. We love you. Lord, I pray that we would be the men and women and the children that you've called us to be. That every one of us would trust in you as Savior and Lord today.